welcome to Diddy Church. Here at Diddy Church, we've been studying in the book of John. We have, as it were, gone from outside to inside. Matter of fact, I better write this down because I'm thinking, wait a minute, what verse are we on? <laughs> so I better get to the verse, otherwise we may just simply rehearse what we're doing. So going back over another version or another video or video that we've recorded, I tend to, every now and then, not repeat myself because I like to allow for the Spirit of God within me to lead me the direction that He wants to go. But I have been known to give a complete Bible study on the exact same verse and come up with all kinds of new stuff. Now, it doesn't mean I did it, but God, by His Spirit, teaches all of us. And I thought I was going to stand up, so I was practicing standing up right now, but now looking over at the monitor, I realized, uh, I might not have adjusted it right, and since my back is out, and I threw it out the other day, I think I'm going to sit for this service. <laughs> Which, in Jewish culture, would be typical, because usually what happened was that when a rabbi was teaching, he wasn't preaching, teaching, or standing, but he was seated. It was kind of a position of respect, you know, that. Middle Eastern culture, you know, the highest one or whatever, you would bow. I mean, you, you learn that about China and Japan and how they bow and all the different things that go on as far as elevation and uprising and downsitting is what David called it in the Psalms. But what we, um, I think we're going to study in, you know, I'm going to take the time just now to show you how we are in Vidibo Church. We don't hold to a set pattern where it's like, oh, no interruptions, I'm sorry, you can't do that, baby. Or, I'm sorry, no, sir, uh, excuse me, we have a service going on. Or, you gotta go to the bathroom? Hold it. Well, I personally, if I had to go to the bathroom, I'd say, could you hold that thought for a minute and I'd go to the bathroom. I mean, that's the way it should be. We bring out at church lots of times some misconceptions and perceptions that are false. Somehow we make the sanctuary holy. Well, lately, if you've gone to church, you've noticed that that idea has blown the coop because you got people sitting in church and pews with Cokes and sodas, cookies, food. Matter of fact, you know, it almost looks like a theater. Oh, wait a minute. It does look like a theater, doesn't it? So why don't we serve popcorn at our services? So you see, I'm, I'm not saying that the sanctuary shouldn't be treated with respect. I'm saying that most churches today already have less than a formal perspective on their sanctuary. Now the Catholics obviously have made huge cathedrals that are gorgeous and wonderful. And they use natural lighting and air, all kinds of tricks and maneuvers of architecture in order to get what you've got when you go in one. And I'll be honest with you, when I walk in one, I don't look around and see a bunch of idols. I walk in and go, God. Or wow, either one, it doesn't matter to me. But you see, I'm Jewish, so I don't really feel bad about going anywhere. You know, I feel like I can go anywhere, anytime, any place, and God will speak to me. So, saying all that, and talking about less than formal, I'm going to go check and see my note over here, because I'll, actually all we really do for preparation is go, well, where are we? What did we teach last? How, what, what are we doing? You know, and I teach so many, or I preach so many Bible studies, topicals, prophecy, and other areas of ministry that I really don't know where we are on our, as you might discover by the title, Sunday Sunrise Service at Video Church with Michael James Stone. Oh, you don't know me? Hey, I'm Michael James Stone. Glad to meet you. So hold that thought for a minute, and maybe you could ponder our little uh, table, <laughs> pulpit. You could call it an arch or an arc or whatever you want to. You can make it into whatever you want to imagine. But really, God doesn't even need this in order to speak. God doesn't need me in order to relate to you. God really can teach you by yourself alone with him if you choose to go that route. If not, then you could just hold on for a second, and we'll continue to talk while we're looking at which Bible verse we're actually on. And as I look up what we had previously studied, it looks like we had done John 
116, and then we had kind of skipped over, and I guess did the law of God, or the law of Moses, with um, law, grace, and truth, part 1 and 2, and then came back to John 118, which I'm imagining means that we did 117 was a two-part study of the law of Moses, because 117 says, I don't have it memorized. I'll look at it. And by the way, you know, the numbers aren't important, but for you guys that, you know, use chapters and verses and numbers, eh, you know, I don't memorize that way, but okay, we'll do it. 117, the reason why we had a two-part series was because for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we actually did two weeks of Sunday sunrise service devoted to that verse, that concept. A lot of times people don't realize this, but we don't have a play-by-play -play genealogy or accurate account sometimes of exactly every single detail that happened or every word. Sometimes there are scriptures that are written that are conceptualizations of what was said, meaning that the words themselves have more meaning and purpose and design to them that they are perfect where they're at, as they are the way they are, as we state in integral specificity as opposed to systematic theology. But in integral specificity, we say there's a reason why it's here. Now let's find out the reason. So we're not taking something to study of God, but we're waiting for God to show us what and why it's there. In other words, systematic theology makes you the student and the teacher in a way because you're interpreting but we don't want to interpret. We want you to study for yourself to have God reveal to you what's it here for. Why is it here? What's it mean? And so in 17, when it says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, we didn't use that as a proof text. We didn't use that as a topical. We used that as God is saying something. Let's see what he's saying. And that's it. Bottom line is it took two sunrise services to discuss that. And we've already gone through verse 18, which says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared it. And it's interesting because then we get to verse 19, which supposedly now, this is just because of books, and because some editor somewhere down the road decided, Hey, I think there should be a paragraph here. So this supposedly is a new paragraph, because I can see a little paragraph mark. And verse 19 that we're looking at says, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Background story obviously is, well, John, because if John's writing about John, then is John writing about John himself or is he writing about another John? And to make this understandable rather than just stick with just that verse, when you read the context, always, and I'm going to say this over and over again a lot in our in depth light upon line, study, and I don't say precept on precept, but, you know, the line by line has precepts in it. That's why it kind of, you know, it's a long story about what Jesus meant when he used that line upon line, precept upon precept. You know, here a little, there a little, blah, blah, blah. But suffice it to say that there's more to what goes on always in the Word of God than what we actually know of ourselves examining the Bible. Now, we've brought ourselves to a place where we need to stop. No, I don't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Maybe you do. Maybe you should go now. You know. Maybe you should open your Bible now. You know, and turn to you know all those kind of goofy things that people do. You know, in church, we don't do that at medieval church. But I do have to explain medieval church a little bit. Not much. It won't take long. But medieval church is the idea and the concept that we are recording videos that are devotional to God, meaning that. We are expressing our faith as a devotion, as a living example of what Jesus said to be, which would be to say, we are his witnesses and we testify to these things that they are true. So, if you don't know what we're reading or doing or applying in the Bible, you should go home and read it, study it, and understand it so that you can use this video presentation from video church, sunrise service with me, Michael James Stone, to incorporate the Spirit of God to enlighten you to what it is He wants you to do with what you have read is in the Word of God that has become to you the veritable living Word that means it has been inspired.
inspired and enlightened to you because your spirit bears witness with his spirit that you are a son and daughter of God. That means you're hearing God speak, maybe through the Bible, maybe through a devotional, maybe audibly, maybe as a still small voice. I don't think you're going to hear him in a storm. I don't think you're going to hear him in the cyclone or the tornado. It could be. He could be saying, get out. <laughs> Run for your life. I mean, God works that way, believe it or not. Doesn't use quite those words, but it's similar, you know. <laughs> Flee. That's basically the same thing. So, when I said we're going to stop here, we're going to pray. I mean, you know, it's not something that we have to do, because anything that I do, I've already started with God to say, look, God, you know, I'm not one of these religious fanatics that every day I'm going to get up and pray the same way and bow my head and scrape and kneel and, you know, make sure every bone in my body is jiggling and wiggling so that I fulfill the Torah commandment, you know, and that somehow I haven't broken any of the Sikhrin this book or any other thing that's going on as far as Jews are concerned. And then I have to go back and look at what the Christians are talking about and then we got to add what the Catholics have said and the Protestants have said and the Evangelicals are saying and the, the Pentecostals are saying and the Charismatics are saying and then get back all the way down to the Calvary Chapels are saying and then get down to what the people are doing and the people are wanting and the people are saying. We forget about well, what did God say? You know, I mean, dude, the reality is if God is God, he knows you pray. You don't have to pray in front of people because Jesus said don't do that. You don't have to pray before you do something. Because Jesus said, don't do that. You don't have to pray after you do something because you say that. Frankly, you want to give thanks, you say, thank you, Lord. Or you want to pray, you say, God help me. Or you say, you know, whatever you may say. If it's a prayer of salvation, you say, help, save me. Hosanna is what the word is. But, no, if you were drowning, would you stop, wait until you were properly, you know, acquainted and went through all the different steps? You know, let's do prayer, adoration, confession, you know, and all the other things that people say. Well, if you do this, and you do that, and you twist this, and you twist that, you're going to get this, that, and the other thing. It doesn't sound like a living God to me. It sounds like a religious God to me. And I got news for you. Jesus talking to a woman at the well said, look, you know, I get it that you think you're supposed to worship on this mountain, and I get it that our people say we're supposed to worship on that hill, or vice versa, as it was in Samaria. But I can tell you that neither one is true. Soon people will be worshiping in spirit and truth. And now, boy, do we get such wide open, stupid, I'm going to call it stupid, I can get away with it, sort of, forgive me, stupid theology over what spirit and truth is. It wasn't that complicated to begin with, but now it is. Spirit and truth just meant be real, do it spiritually. Meaning that, hey, if God by his spirit created the universe, and it created the heavens and the earth, it created the sun, the moon, the stars, and the sky, and then created the animals, and the land, and the water, and the earth, and then created man, and then created woman out of the river man, and all that stuff. Good. Well, it says that God walked in the cool of the day and spent time with, you know, man in order to converse and to have conversation. I think God doesn't have to have a criteria in order to meet him, and he doesn't have to be bow down, scrape, you know, up against the wall, you know, kind of prayer. Oh, God, I got this wall. I'm holding it up because that's what's holding back the earth, you know, up on Temple Mount. And that this is holy because we say it's holy. And quite frankly, before we got here, you know, it wasn't too holy. It was actually full of roots and everything else. It looked pretty disgusting. But now that we have tourists and everybody's watching and we got a video camera watching, hey, we're holy. That's not holy. Jesus confronted his own disciples in thinking that the house of prayer was there and that it wasn't really God had left the house already because he was standing there in the house. In other words, the Spirit of God was not in the temple when Jesus visited. Sorry, wasn't. Already blew the coop. Be careful. You may find yourselves in the same place sometimes when you're in a church and it all seems religious, holy, and wonderful religiously and seems mysterious subjectively. But in reality, none of this is anything important, but it is a shadow of things to come. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't that big a deal. God was testing and training people to do what he said. So, of course, if he said, don't do, you did, you died. That's it. He used that example as to put the fear of the Lord into them so they would be also aware of all the other laws so they would follow them. Because they were a people that had no law. They had been absorbed by a culture, Egyptian culture, but still, absorbed by a lot of mysterious ideas in Egypt and a lot of false 
false concepts by generations of even though they held to the faith somewhat, God wanted to let them know this is who I am. And so he gave the law of Moses to them. And they learned civil law. They learned the law of tort. They learned the, all the laws that you see in the land today. Why don't you cross a crosswalk against the red light? Because you'll get run over, stupid. Because we have laws that are governing cars and people. We don't put cars and say, hey, go do what you want to do, and the car runs you over. You're dead. We say, in order to have a civilized society, we have to have a certain amount of ordinances, rules, and regulations. That's what the law of Moses was, folks. They were trying to set up a society, and God was giving them certain outward laws that, you know, Moses, the old joke goes, in Jewish culture, Moses goes, hey, God. You know, we, we, we got a lot of people down there, and man, they, they, they don't know what they're doing. Matter of fact, they, you know, they'll, they'll cross against the red light. They'll, uh, walk into water and drown. I mean, they don't get it. You know, they'll, they'll not cook their meat. You know, they'll mix things up, you know, get things all backwards. We gotta do something. God says, Moses, tell you what I'm gonna do. Tell you what I'm gonna do. I'll give you ten. He said, no, nah, no, nah, I ain't gonna work. Ten will never work on these people. Wait a minute. I didn't say ten. I said one. Oh, I thought you said ten. Well, no, I said one, but there's ten commandments. So there's one that'll do them all, but there's ten. Well, the one will never work. So give me the ten. So God gives him the ten. He says, nah, that's my people. I'm sorry. I've seen what they do. Ain't going to work. Tell you what, God, I'll make you a deal. You give me the ten, I'll give you 613. That's how we are. It's a paraphrase, it's a metaphor, it's a simile, but it's more true if you know, well, if you're Jewish, you already know it's true, but if you know Jewish culture and the Talmud and the way that we got the mitzvot and the way that we got 613 out of, really, 1 and 10, then you know it's true. It's an aspect of the reality of why humanity can't govern itself. We see that today in our president-elect. He has no self-control. He's not a Christian pretty obvious. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. But when I said we're going to stop, because the problem with what happens to the people, the problem that happens to you and I, the problem that goes on with prayer is that we make it into something it's not, so we'll do for your sake once the reality of, oh God, please anoint the point and direct and inspire and cause my words to come out like your words and be all with the people and you know, this, that, and the other thing. So it's like, oh, God, you know, bless the people in Jesus' name, amen. You know what I mean? Hey, yeah, such a deal. But, no, I mean, I can pray. You know, I say, Father, you know, by your spirit, would you guide the people into knowing you in a more personal and intimate way? Amen. And so we deal with it for perfunctory. So those that have their conscience, you know, meeting that, answer them. Those that don't worry about it, you have an attitude of prayer. Pray always, you know, we're told, so you should be. As soon as you woke up, you should have been praying, you should have continued prayer. The only way you can do that is be in an attitude of prayer. Don't be like the Jews who constantly go, yeah, 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 yo, 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 no, 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 ha, 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 ha. Ah, I'm Jewish. Now we got Christians going, hey, I'm a yeah, yeah. I'm a yo, yo. I'm a yahusha, husha, 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 whatever. You know what I mean? What? That's not God. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the revelation of God to us. Hello? Follow him, God said to all the people. This is my beloved Son, and whom I will please. Listen to him. So, having prayed, I want to say this about City Boat Church, because this is what is about for you. Here at City Boat Church, we use this expression to define our faith. It's like our creed. We live by Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and James 1, 5, put it well, if any man like wisdom, I'm asking God who prays not to give all my liberty. So if you have a question about what we're doing, go ask God, and then you know, find out what he has to say. Because James 1, 5 says you can't. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 just simply says, you ain't going to understand it anyway, so guess what? You might as well trust in him, because you don't need to trust in man, because you're not supposed to trust in man, you're supposed to trust in the Lord. So do that, and you'll be led by the Lord. So if you're here, then you were led of the Lord in order to find out what it is that God has for you, in order for you to be at one with him, so that you can go one-on-one, -on -one rather than one with a hundred, try to find out where your mass hysteria came from, because you were with a hundred people trying to figure out what the one God is trying to say to the one person in a mass of a hundred. 
So we say here at Video Church, the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God of the son of God, Jesus. In other words, the Bible is a Bible is a Bible is a Bible. It's just a book, folks. I can tear it. I can burn it. I can rip it up and I'm not going to die. God is not going to kill me because I've written in my Bible or that it's some kind of like, you know, Torah where I got to go, oh, mwah, mwah, mwah. I love the word. Tastes like honey in the rock. Mwah, yeah, it tastes mean like print. No, that's stupid. And frankly, my people are stupid in some ways. We personally, you know, put a lot of religious trappings on top of it to make it sound like it's spiritual. But even Jews look at Jews and go, seriously? Are you kidding me? You kiss it? <laughs> or even worse is going up to the Western Wall and then kissing that. <sighs> That's like the Blarney Stone. At least the Irish got it right. It was Blarney. It was not real. It's phony. So don't be stupid about your faith. Be wise. Understand that the book does have errors. It could have a printing error. And that doesn't mean that it's infallible or fallible. It simply means that when you look at the Bible, as God by his spirit gives you eyes to see, so you got to get your eyes right, you know, with the Holy Spirit giving you eyes, that means your spirit has to be connected with his spirit, which basically says you've got to be born again, because since the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit because they're spiritually discerned. It's not a genius word here. It's not something super spiritual. you got to go out and, you know, spend five years to figure out that you don't understand the Bible because you can't understand the Bible. But it can lead you to a place where you can come to a place of understanding. Meaning that if it says you've got to be born again, you go, oh, so I've got to be born of the Spirit in order to understand a spiritual work. Well, yeah. Because then once you are born again, born from above, born of the Spirit of God coming inside, then He, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, gives you eyes to see. That's one of the promises. Ears to hear what it is the Spirit of God would say. So He gives you ears spiritual ear, so to speak, or just cleans the wax out of your ears that you got from the world. He gives you a new understanding because he says to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is perfect and successful will of God in Christ Jesus. So he has to kind of like do a house cleaning up here, do a cleaning right here, put some glasses on here, maybe spiritual glasses so you can see all the ghosts wandering around. Eh, wrong. Go upward, not downward. So, giving you ears to hear is simply clarifying what you are hearing, and then he gives you a heart. He takes your stony heart out and gives you a new heart so you would understand. We're told <laughs> so many things about how the Spirit of God works that that's why people mess up the book. It isn't God's Spirit telling them to do it. They're reading it and using their own understanding. And remember we said that about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Be not your own understanding. No, 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 no. You try to understand, you're wrong. It's that simple. I can tell when somebody's come up with their own idea. I personally have done that. <laughs> come up with my own ideas. I have way more cults that I could create in my mind than anybody ever dreamed of coming up with. Because I was a sci-fi, like, you know, advocate. You know, I love that, you know, advocating the sci-fi effect of God on reality of Christianity and how we all need to get more of a perspective from the reality of this earth is not the truth, but the perspective is one from God being spirit that we have to understand that this is passing away and the lust thereof, but that is going to be eternal. So that's why we see first evil God Christ just all these things we had out of us. Because this is in our home, this is not real, it is a shadow of things to come. And we know by physics that even our eyes only relate that to seeing a candle because somewhere in our mind our educated brain said this is a candle that has this kind of perspective. If we could see what it really is, it wouldn't look quite like that because we'd interpret it into what it actually is. The atoms and all the other things, it wouldn't be a candle. Now I know physics is a little confusing, so we went pretty deep there for a minute, but that's, you know, okay, that's what we do here a lot at Bidigo Church. Bring it back home to perspective. So that you have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the heart to understand, so that your spirit and his spirit connect. Then, this Bible, not as a infallible production or publication, but this Bible becomes not a Bible, but the Word of God.
because then it's God speaking, not you reading. That's the way it works. I mean, you know, you can try to, you know, put systematic theology in there and say, well, we have to do an expositional teaching on the reality of our systematic examination of the outward manifestation of the words themselves and get our hermeneutic correct and add some homiletic so we can apply it. So that way, by way of our intellect, we can stimulate our mind into understanding the reality that we have to approach God on our own meaning of our not quite understanding what we're saying but going right into a place where we decide that the system works because we've made these certain rules and regulations that are called doctrines and dogmas, and we've adapted them and applied them so that we think this is right, and we never ask God in the first place, what do you want? I found, frankly, you know, in systematic theology, errors. I looked at it that God isn't systematic means system, and doesn't that mean theology is a study of you? So why would I want systematic theology when I can have integral systematic? God said, ooh. <laughs> In other words, I can have the reality, or I can have the study of the reality. I took integral specificity, a different style, you want to call it that, of schools of thought. You know, you had the school, you've heard of these things, you know, like school of Hillel, school of Gamaliel, or whatever. That's meaning for a Jew that Framing their way of looking at the Bible, this is how they did it, looking through the school of Hillel. School of Hillel said, you know, certain parameters have to be applied to the Bible in order to understand it. Either literal, physical, a bunch of other things. You know, there are 49 different variations of interpretation according to the scriptures, you know, about themselves. So, Jews, being that they didn't have the Spirit of God, wanted to apply their own intellect, and boy, don't let a Jew get his intellect involved. It'll get really confusing. So, when I asked God, he gave me integral specificity. I went to Google, I looked it up, and I found out what integral specificity is according to Google, and I went, well, that makes perfect sense. The integer is the Bible words, and the specificity is for the way of the Spirit choosing to use those words, so it's just like the genome and the specific instructions that are written on every integral part of the integer that creates within its whole a conglomerate of what we call the DNA RNA helix, don't say that word, of life itself, and life is generated when you have a continuity of all these integral parts specific to what their function is, that they create and cause life to exist. I went, okay, I got integral specificity for physical life, I have integral specificity for spiritual life. Hey, makes sense to me. So, that's why we do what we do the way we do as we do it. Such as it is. So when I said stop, I meant pray, you know, take a moment, whatever you want to do, you know, just kind of let God do in you what He wants. He may have already taken you off on a tangent and you've gone down the daisy road, you know, and you're looking at things. I did that at Chuck Smith Church, you know, at the Calvary Chapel Coast Mesa. Lots of times Chuck would start talking, you know, and then he would, you know, give, he'd give a Bible study on a Sunday night, then he'd start talking about how flies, what happens to flies at night when the lights go out, you know, and I'd just be suddenly wandering in my Bible looking at other things. It was like, I heard Chuck say it, I know what he said, but, you know, it's like, you know, I was more into right then, I want, you know, meat, and he was giving me sweets, you know, so I was like, hey, he's sweet in the pot with a lot of stories that were wonderful, and I, I know more about a lot of things that I didn't know before, you know, and he was that kind of man, and I, God bless him, you know, he's in heaven, and he's um, you know, the whole thing about heaven and people looking down, it don't work out. But anyway, we'll just leave it at, he's in heaven. And suffice to leave Revelation studies to Revelation studies. So when we say now, beginning in John, because we had to, you know, recoup because we've been out of John for a while, that in verse 19, and this is the record of John, when Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? I like that. You see, the context, historically, is simply, you know, hey, there's a guy out there in the desert, he's doing something, and we want to know what's going on. So, because he got popular, then they really want to know what's going on. Same thing happened at the church I was in. I was at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, and there were people sent to Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa to find out why was it so successful, and what kind of cult are they? 
I happened to have worked in the Calvary Chapel tape lending library, so we used to get all the skeptics to come in to get tapes to find out what we were doing really. They wanted some evidences, you know, about how false we were. We had priests come in, we had Catholics come in, we had cults come in, we had newspaper people come in, we had people come in from all around the world even and get cassettes, tapes of the services. Sometimes they would look around and see all the other stuff we had there of all the services from around and they would, you know, like, wow, that's pretty neat. What's the cost? We need nothing. Free library. You lose it, don't worry about it. Just come back and keep you know, checking out tapes. But you know, we're free library. Free receipts in the year. And, you know, I think now they charge, you know, maybe not to borrow, but I think they charge for mailing. But, you know, yeah, yeah. but people wanted to know, who are you? What are you doing? And this particular verse is simply speaking about John the Baptist, as we call him. He wasn't the Baptist. He wasn't a Baptist. He wasn't in any way, shape, or form the founder of the Baptist church. I know there are people that like to think so. There are people that will tell you so, but that's not how the Baptist church got started. You know, there's always, ah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Bartholomew. I'm the church of Bartholomew. You know, oh boy. You know, it's like, come on, guys. Nobody was a church, to, you know, for a while, because after 300 years of persecution, then we wound, wound up with, you know, the state was the church. You know, but before that, everybody was getting killed and martyred, you know, and there was no continuity, no compression of everyone's faith into one segment or sect that could be called, hey, they are messianic. Even the messianic church is stupid because they say, well, we're the original ones. We were messianic. We followed Jesus. No, we didn't. There were Christians and Gentiles and people that were Gnostics and all kinds of cults getting started all at the same time, just like today. In other words, Jesus had come on the scene. Jesus had left the scene. The disciples were on the scene. Then all of a sudden, massive persecution comes. And bingo, everybody's going out like Jesus had already warned them to do before they went out. But they finally went out into the world because they were being kicked out of Israel and evangelized the world. And they did. And then, because there was no centralized result, suddenly, I think, you know, a lot of the Spirit of God got quenched simply because they organized. You know, they said, well, wait a minute, we got to get this organized here, folks. You know, who is this Jesus, and where did he come from? And so they went back to Israel, and they said, oh, look at this land, it's all messed up, we need to clean it up and pick out the spots where Jesus was born, died, resurrected, and all of that stuff. So you wind up with a lot of argumentation in Catholic Church versus, you know, Jewish Jews who live there, and Arabs who live there, you know, and Gypsies who live there. By the way, Gypsies have been around you know, since the very beginning. I don't know if you realize this. You know, I, I helped get some Gypsies recognized as having lived there in Jerusalem since probably all the way back to the days of Nehemiah. Huh. Dare I say, they aren't the Bedouins, they're Gypsies. The Bedouin are a whole different story. They've been around forever and they're still there. They're based upon the uh, scripture that says, and the sons of and I can't think of his name right now. Hadid? Hadid? I don't know. Um, are they that dwell in tents and to this day they still dwell in tents? That's the Bedouin. <laughs> they still dwell in tents. Oh, they got TV antennas on top of their tents, but they're still tent people. Still around. The Bible's true. People don't understand that. It's a fact, Jack. So, when we're talking about that, we know the historical setting. We know kind of, you know, basically, because if we read the next one or you wanted to read it all in context, I'm not going to read it all out of context because we can do that the next time we get together for a sunrise service. Right now we're playing catch up. But you could read from verse 19 all the way down to 20 and 20, we'll say, and he confessed and says, hey, look, I'm not the Christ. And he goes on to say, are you Elijah? I'm not the prophet. Well, basically, it's setting us up to let you know what's going to happen. I like the idea that this is the record of God. This is this is the story of this is a a the word record means that John is making a very John by the way it's funny when you start to say something you get a whole new group of people that you have to kind of recant well not recant recount what you've already taught told. John has a priestly background. He was not just simply sub official. He wasn't like stupid or you know drunk like Peter. Peter wasn't stupid, but he was drunk a lot. But he wasn't just simply a fisherman. Every family sent someone to 
the school of religion, so to speak, seminary, if you want to call it that, Bible school, if you want to call it that, but every Jewish family or community had someone that they sent to, hopefully, to get into um, the study of Torah, of the prophets, the law of the prophets, to go to Jerusalem to learn. John was very much so into studying. We have hints that he might have studied with John the Baptist. He um, probably was in some way influenced by John the Baptist, but what he's doing here is that he's showing that he also has a pharisaical or a temple trained mindset that not only does he know some of the, the mystical concepts that we see in John, and we'll see later, the book of John, the gospel of John, and then first John also, and then in the book of Revelation, he's pretty much, you know, right on track with what he did and experienced. But God ordained that he should have those experiences. But prior to meeting Jesus, his family or his community had sent him, and they could afford to, to Jerusalem to study. And so he had learned some, because we know this by way of where he was able to get into the temple when Jesus was going through the trial. He had recorded certain things no one could know. And it wasn't because he had someone. He was there. He saw it. He was allowed to see Jesus crucified. He was allowed certain privileges of going someplace and doing something that the common citizen wasn't allowed to. There are commoners. There are those that are Levites. There are those that are priests. There are those that are religious leaders. There are those, I mean, the cultural stepladder of what people are is not a dissimilar to today. We have theologians, you know, we have priests, we have preachers, we have ministers, we have pastors, we have prophets, we have apostles. There are a lot of people that do a lot of things in religious ordinances that are according to their faith and measure of faith. No different in Israel at the time. Israel was not just, you know, three different groups vying for power in the temple politics or being held under control by the Roman Empire, but they were... 30, at least 30 sects we know of, and a few more that I'm pretty sure that, you know, some do say more, some do say less, but pretty sure we're all confident of the 30. Of the more, I'm more with the more than I am with the less. You know, only because of the sects that say something, but that's just Jewish culture, and you know, kind of not the encyclopedia of Judaica. Sorry, that's what somehow you get a lot of Christians to think that that's the absolute last word on Jewish. That's like asking, how do you become a Christian? Well, look it up in the dictionary. Okay. <laughs> Might give you some information, but we got to do something with it. But John, because he had this access and he had this training, was able to say and use a word here that's very important. This is the record of John. This isn't a testament. This is a detailed, factual, we would say, evidentiary that is acceptable in a court of law, that is something that has been testified to, witnessed to, and is a fact jack. It is acceptable without ever being delineated or desecrated or dissected into something else. It's a record. It's not a history. It's not a genealogy. It's not a speculation. It's not anything else but a record. And the records that are there of your birth are that factual. That's the word he uses. Record. It means that when you need to go get a driver's license, you go back to your record of your birth to prove you are who you are. You have a record of your birth, hopefully. If not, then you have people that will testify of your record so that you can have a record recorded somewhere with a stamp seal of approval that says, yes, that's Joe Blow. Other people may come along and change that record, but... You know, because they may find out who you really are. But the point is, this record that John is talking about is detailing some information so that they're not just lying about it. Like, we're told that the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, have lied. They said that, you know, well, we're paying the guards to tell them that, you know, they stole the body. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, corruption is corruption no matter where it comes from or where it goes. We have corruption in prophecy circles. Unbelievable. Because when someone's wrong, they just lie about it. Lying has become a pattern of behavior in Christianity, unfortunately. You confront a pastor in his sin and he'll just go, you're at my church. 
notice the word. And they'll throw them out or they'll whatever. One of the people that I think are um, pretty impressive in some way. Now, I don't know the full story, but Mark Driscoll got busted for lying. His church busted him. Uh, people outside the church busted him. And he stepped down from ministry. And then he stepped back in the ministry. Now, I'm not opposed to that. I think that's right. I think you should have a criteria that you live up to, but once God has anointed you, you continue on. You don't stop because you're stupid or you sin. You ask forgiveness, you make restitution, you do whatever it is that God has inspired you to do, then you move on. Now, I do know that Mark Driscoll now has a church and it's growing. Anointing, I don't know, but I only know that that's just an example of giving. So the point being about that is simply to say that we have John, who knows that the scribes are going to look at this, who knows that the Pharisees are going to look at this, so he's going to keep a detailed record of this intercourse or communication between two different kinds of people, Jewish, that aren't going to agree. He knows that. So he's writing this to say, this is the record. This is the fact. This is how it happened. And I guess that's what I would like to know. And we'll wrap this up, Sunday Sunrise Service, here at Indigo Church with this thought. Who are you? Who art thou? Is there a record of who you are? Have you left behind certain telltale signs that say a forensic expert could go back and say, you know, I think this guy was a Christian. He said a lot on Facebook. He did a lot on YouTube. You know, there are people out there that I've met that, you know, say that, yes, the guy just wouldn't shut up about Jesus. He was the most obnoxious person I ever met. I hated him. And in that hate, that's a record. That is a testifying testimony. If it was produced in a court of law, then it would be a record. But it is a testimony of someone saying, yes, that's what the person is. Who art thou? Thou art a Christian. We see that by your action. We see, see that by your intellect or your intelligence. We see that by the things you are doing and the things you are becoming. We know you're not perfect. That's what a Christian is not perfect. But we know you're seeking to become better than what you were. And that leads me to another question that I have to ask. When I look at President-elect Trump, I mean, I'm not picking on him. He just happens to be the flavor of the month, I guess. But he being in prophecy, I believe, not as the Antichrist, so I want to make it clear. Nowhere in Bible Church, Biblical Prophecy Today, or any of the other ministries that we are, we have on the internet, has ever we said that Donald Trump or any American could ever be the Antichrist. They can't. The Antichrist comes out of Europe. Bottom line. Won't be an American. Now, we call Mr. Trump, the president-elect, as a anti-president, because he represents everything a president is not. And that seems obvious that he is flesh-driven. Because of all the things he has said, the things that he has done, the lifestyle, the choices, the decisions he's making, and the decisions he has made. There isn't any indication that anything has changed at all. As a matter of fact, he's even more so of not being a Christian than he was of before so, at least at times, going quiet, and nobody knew so, which way he would go. So, we have to ask, who is that? Or, who are you? And I will say to you, bluntly, when the president-elect gets into office, he's going to do things you will not like, Christian. And those Christians who said he was a Christian are wrong. He has more than persuaded us that we know he's being, unfortunately, overworked, overpressured. He's in a position he cannot handle. He's doing things he doesn't know how to relate to. He is out of his element because he is just a businessman and a businessman not of a, quote, type that goes upward, but rather that manipulates the law and chooses to, unfortunately, use unethical, immoral ways to adapt for himself a profit rather than an investment in the kingdom of God. People have told this ministry that I can't say that, I can't do that, I can't be talking about the president-elect of the United States because he is God's man. No, he's not. God's man is you. God's woman is you. God has chosen every single person in this world 
for salvation, but they, by way of their choices, determine their damnation. So they have the opportunity to be God's man of the hour or God's tool he's using to demonstrate damnation that we should choose as a nation not to follow the path that someone has chosen to go. I don't have to accept the man himself in the office of the presidency to pray for him. I can pray for his salvation, which I do. I pray he gets saved. I recognize at the same time while I'm praying that I'm half-hearted about it because Jesus said, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And I know what that means. I work for rich men. I still, to this day, will tell you, no matter how many philanthropic acts they do after they're rich, they lied, cheat, and stole their way to get to the top. They did a lot of illegal things, immoral things. Some people were told that, like J.C. Penney, I guess, or maybe um, that one tractor company, you know, were pretty ethical and moral on their way up through making money. They, we are told that I think it was um, Penny who had in his store the prayer room. Now, when he's gone, of course, it's changed. But I'm told that I think it's either Penny or the, or the tractor um, millionaire. Today, I don't see that, but, you know, might have been back then. Who knows? I know you can research that and find it because I know that, you know, Jay Harvey, whatever, mentioned it. Um, there are other things that you can look up on YouTube, but those are YouTube on uh, Google, but those aren't details that I'm very intimately familiar with right now. I had been, just can't remember right now, top of my head. But when we look at Mr. Trump, we would have to say, is that someone you want your child to be like? Because, frankly, what our goal is, is to present a witness and a testimony that says, look, I'm not who I want to be, but I'm trying. And I'm trying to be like Jesus. So, I don't tell people follow. I tell people follow Jesus. You see, there's an interesting dialogue that went on about that. Because there are people that will tell you, you know, look, I'm a pastor, you know, you can count on me, and I'll tell you this, and that, and the other thing, and whatever, blah, blah, blah. In heaven, you're not going to have a pastor there or a church or denomination or anyone else. They will be held accountable for you, but you're not going to be able to hold them accountable to you, except for now, before you get to heaven. But Jesus talking to Peter, who was very much into power and authority, even after he had kind of blown it, you know, a lot, he still had this, you know, personality he just couldn't get rid of. And he'd already failed the Lord. So here John is. That John will mention eventually in the end of the book that John is standing there while Jesus is talking to Peter. And Peter, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what kind of attitude he had, but he kind of looked over at him and he says, Well, what about him? You know, what about him? And Jesus, obviously knowing what the attitude was, confronted Peter and says, Look, you follow me. Don't worry about him. If I want him around until the end of the era, end of the world, what's that to you? You follow me. In other words, he slapped him down. He rebuked him. Jesus is not, uh, you know, I don't know what your Christianity is like, but, but uh, my Jesus that I'm following is not some kind of lollipop sucker kind of person that says, hey, you know, everything's nice and I took care of it all, so just be, you know, blessed and all the rest I'll cover. Uh, my God has told me to take up my cross and follow him. There are days that I am blessed out of my mind that I don't deserve. There are days that I deserve more and I got blasted. I mean, there are times where God says to me blunt things that I don't want to hear, but I accept them. There are times where God says to me things I want to hear and I reject them even sometimes. I don't like his love. I mean, sometimes I just go, no, Lord, you know, I, I don't deserve it. I, you know, I, I'm evil. I'm sinner. You know, I, gosh, I don't, I don't really want to. Be your man of the hour. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter. My choice. Jesus would huh, put it that way. Okay. <laughs> what can you say when he said, I picked you? Really? Why? <laughs> I mean, that should be your attitude. Why me? You know? So, when I look at Donald, no. He's not the President of the United States. He's a man that is in a position that he can't handle. Um, if he gets out of office and maybe repents, you know, and does things, you know, differently, 
God might save them, you know, but, you know, just like we talk about in prophecy, we have 80% probability that the Lord's going to return sometime between 2017 and 34, and probability increases at 2022 when that new star appears from 80% to 90%, so sometime between 2022 and 2034, the 80% goes to 90% during that time period. Probability. Doesn't mean it will. Because even a 1%, God could still use. That being said, the probability of Donald Trump being a Christian right now is 100% no. Ah, no chance. If there was some point in time where he so supposedly told the pastors around him, I'm a Christian, I accept Jesus, I do this, that, and everything. Yes, okay. Then guess what? The seed got stolen and the birds came and choked it out and the man's faith the second time around was worse than the first time around. So I got news for you. If he was, he isn't anymore. <laughs> Bottom line, I mean, come on. I don't need to get the discernment to know that. I mean, it's pretty obvious. And so do you. And you know that. You want it to be different. So do I. I wouldn't mind having a, another Christian like Barack Obama and like the president before him, Bush, and like Carter and like the other Bush. A man at least Christian in going to church and learning about Jesus. Maybe I don't know if they're born again or not. I know some of them are. You know, some of them said so. Um, but I know that Barack Obama was never a Muslim, and so when people buy, it's a sign of the times. It's a sign of their own times, and what God is going to bless them for. So, bringing Donald back into our perspective, who are you? How are you reacting to him? Do you hate? Do you support? See, both are wrong. You can't hate the man, but you can't support the man either. Nowhere does the Bible say you support a person in their sin. Pray for them. You can do that. No, you can't support him. You really can't. When he does things that are immoral, when he does things that are illegal, when he does things that are wrong, you can, I wouldn't say get involved in the politics of it, but I would say, you can say, no, that's wrong. Just like I do all the time. If people yell at me and scream and holler and tell me I can't do that because he's a Christian or whatever they may say. I just look at him and say, well, tell you what, why don't you ask Jesus about it? I do. I go to Jesus and say, God, is he a Christian? No. Okay. Phew. You know, I don't get a short answer. I get a quick answer. Not always that way. A lot of things aren't directly answered that fast. For me, yeah. I can pray and ask. What do I have to tell you to do from, you know, medieval church? You have to pray and ask according to your family and your choices. For a medieval church, no, we don't support Donald Trump. I'm sorry. We support the concept that he is the anti-president, and that in his presidency, if he changed it, he wouldn't be the anti-president. He would be an example of either forgiveness, mercy, or grace, which could still happen. He could still develop, and then God would have shown what his grace was for by saving someone as off the wall and as long and as anti-president as could be, Donald Trump, and make him into the man that he could be or should be or might be in the future. Personally, I think you're flipping a coin and looking at it from a, you know, wishful thinking idea, but it's happened before, maybe it'll happen again. Living in the last days, I don't think so. So we stand on our anti-president perspective. He's the anti-president. Now, I personally have, for some reason, some idea that Ivanka got to say, I don't know, it's just kind of a weird thought, you know, flying through my bread every head every time I think about it, because, you know, well, she's married to a Jew, so if I remember right, but, um, I always just get this idea that even though she's all wrapped up in her own world and stuff, I get this feeling that God might save her. That works for them now. I don't think God will save her. Who knows? But regardless of those away from us and far away, what about those closer to us? He talked about in this verse, this is the record of John. What's the record of you, David? What's the record of you, James? or Mary, or Pete, or Hillary, or, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I had to throw that in just for the heck of it. Clinton, you know, because people hate these people, so I just have to throw these hate things out there because see if they react. If they react with hate, you're busted! You gotta, I react with humor. I think it's funny. I really do, because people give themselves away all the time that they're not a Christian, or that they have fleshy areas they really need to grow up in. But this is the record of whoever, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, what the 
So if I'm sending someone to you and I ask, who are you? Do you have an answer? We're going to read later on about what John answered, which is a real interesting. I mean, I love the answer because sometimes people come up to me and say, are you Christian? I'll say, I used to say no. Um, when I first got saved, I would say, no, I'm born again. Well, that's a Christian. No, that's not a Christian. One day. I'm born again. But I'm not a Christian. You know, and, you know, and they didn't get it. You know. Well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say to you today, am I a Christian? No. I'm not Christ-like. I'm a sinner. I'm saved by grace. I'm a person who seeks after and follows Jesus in a personal and intimate way. I relate Jesus in the Christian faith as who he has said he is and as he relates to me as not a Christian, but as the Son of God, the Son of Man, born of a virgin who is Jewish in his flesh while he was here on earth, but is more than being Jewish or Gentile, male or female. He is God and one with God. He is with the everlasting Father and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And they are the Godhead, the Elohim, as it were in Hebrew, of God that we do not understand, no matter what kind of picture you put of a triangle and say is, was, not, whatever. We don't know what God is. We only know what God has said to us. And what God has said, he's determined that we can't understand. So he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. So who am I? I am I. That's who I am. I am I. I'm just me. What I am has become by way of what God is making me. So you are you. You are thou. I'm me. That's what happened when Moses went up the mountain. Well, who should I tell you to step with? Hi. Well, no, I need a name. I don't have a name. What do you mean you don't have a name? I don't have a name. I am that I am. You see, that wasn't his name. God never said his name. God never said, I am I am. You know, I am is my name. No, God is an existential being that doesn't have a name because it's bigger than we are, greater than we are. He is the spirit, and that means that we're even way off base whenever we try to put his name on God. He is, as Jesus said, the Father. Dad, he's your creator, yeah, and all the other titles, but he's just Dad. There's a really exactly sometimes, but he's still your father. He's the father of the Lord Jesus. So, I am I. You are you. Who art thou is yet to be determined by you, by your studies, by your application of the manifestation of God in your life, by the intercourse of God speaking directly to you, by Him intervening in your life in such a way that it is demonstrable that you are not alone in this universe. But God created everything, and you can testify it as a record, not as a testimony or a witness. But you can say the record is this. God exists, God lives, God is, and God is in me. You thought of it that way, but I'm going to say this. You can take that thought and say, so God bless you. You know, I should do that. God bless you. You go about doing what it is the Lord would have you to do, and you'll find that these things will be true in you as you do them, as you live them, as you learn them, and as you become them. May the Lord make that true in your life and in mine.